In this video, I'm going to talk about five Flash-based series that have since been continued beyond the browser. After a fairly well-received first installment, I am back with a sub-series that I'm calling Flash Forward. So Flashlight, the larger Umbrella series, is what I'm going to call all of these videos covering Flash games, series creators, and other such subjects in greater detail, while Flash Forward is going to be these highlight shorter collections of old Flash series that have been revived and are continuing on with full releases being brought to the likes of Steam, mobile, or consoles. I want to move things along more quickly than in the first video as my goal is basically to remind you these series exist, what they were all about, key milestones as they were developed, and where the future of the series now lies. I'll save all the lengthy stories and breakdowns for the proper flashlight episodes. Sorry if those naming conventions are becoming at all confusing. I'll keep things as brief as my verbose form of writing will allow. Starting off with Alice is Dead. First beginning back in 2009, this trilogy of short point-and-click noir mystery adventures released over the span of one year. The trilogy's artist, Hyptosis, stormed the fronts of Newgrounds with Alice is Dead as his very first game on the site, one that remains among his most popular contributions to this very day. Programmer Impending Riot didn't have many prior credits, but similarly is still most well known for this series. The two have been a powerhouse pairing ever since, working together frequently over the years. When you boot up these games, the art, style, atmosphere, soundscape, everything layers together to create a sense of unease. It's Wonderland, but not at all a version of it you'll be familiar with. Everything is slightly tweaked or one step removed, dipped in mud and sleezed up a little. There is evidence of a grisly scene with clear foul play, and yet you don't even know who you are, let alone your role in any of it. This first scene kicks off a mystery that spans three games. As you play through, you'll encounter new characters, adding together new details and other scraps of information along the way. Each game has a relevant relatively contained story, giving things the sense of a beginning and an end just in case you played that one episode in isolation as was common when people were looking for new Flash games to play, the trilogy all culminate in a singular ending. These games, the first one especially, pulls heavily from the increasingly popular genre of the time, browser-based escape rooms. Even the second game carries on that spirit, making a primary objective to break free from where you're confined. And once you're able, learning more about the surrounding world in between lapses of panic and confusion. The third episode is a little more open. It starts to settle more firmly into a point-and-click adventure, focused more on exploration, gathering details, all while still solving puzzles. In more recent years, the developers have willingly shared that a lot of this series was made by the seat of their pants, putting in whatever seemed like it would work or felt most interesting at the time, Time, making it a future them problem to then tie things together and pay off specific teases. And according to them, that freeform development is what led to some of their best work, allowing inspiration and pure creativity to take the lead on their project, freeing themselves from the burden of making sure everything was immaculately laid out and intricately planned. They basically did whatever felt or looked cool and tied things together after the fact. The evidence for this is apparent in the occasional loose thread that was left hanging, but there is still an overall conclusion here. One that fans have debated for many years, and often feel only acts as yet another cliffhanger. The original game set the bar tonally. It'll give you the heebie-jeebies, but there are no cheap jump scares or real horror elements. It's entirely about making you feel uncomfortable through your surroundings. It begins to change once you reach the city, less about the unseen mysteries, and more about immersing yourself in this sickly world. You could say it moved from a focus on shady environments to shady characters. There's a lot more story as the series progresses. And now, 13 
15 years later, a complete remake of the trilogy is in the works. This is Alice is Dead Hearts and Diamonds. A free demo remaking Episode 1 is available now over on Steam. This is considered a demo only as it recreates the game in a one-to-one -one manner. For an eventual release, the plan is to expand this episode, adding new lore, details, and interactions, in addition to 100% redone art and programming. This isn't just a remaster, they are starting over from scratch and taking that opportunity to improve the game in any way they can. Hopefully done in a way that doesn't feel like it takes away from what the fans remember the game being. I'm proud to share that I'm publishing this remake, working closely with the developers to steer things through to a full release. I mostly stay out of their way, because luckily they are committed to retaining what the fans remember and love and honoring the spirit and mood of their original creations. It would help us out immensely if you could please wishlist the game over on Steam. That free demo is available now, and down the line we'll be able to start releasing these episodically, starting with that expanded episode 1. The demo is only a tease of what's to come. We don't have a timeline, as the developers are doing this in their spare time, doing their best to re-channel that passion project energy first and foremost that led to the successful creation of those original games. We remain committed to seeing these through no matter what, but hey, I'd be lying if I said that making a bit of profit off of it wouldn't help things along. So please, please do go add it to your wishlist, I'll have links in the description and a pinned comment. Second on the list, Strike Force Heroes. Back 10 years ago, we had the release of the first Strike Force Heroes. Prior to that, Juice Tin of Sky9 Games also created the well known and well loved Flash games A Knight's Quest, Segeus, and the first two Rays games. The games he's likely most well known for outside of Strike Force Heroes. And if you only know Rays and not this franchise, what may help is that it's a very similar series of games, just taking place down on Earth rather than a sci-fi setting. Juice Tin had made a name for himself as a powerhouse Flash developer, always pushing the envelope of Flash with large games loaded with content and plenty of juice. Teaming up with artist Mike Sleva for Strike Force Heroes brought it to the next level. It is an action arena platformer shooter series. The story across the trilogy is quite a lot to unpack, so I'll save that for a possible full series analysis one day, but suffice to say, there is a lot more to this game than blowing enemies to kingdom come. Although, that makes the game well worth it all on its own. You can select between four distinct classes, all with unique strengths and weaknesses and specialty weapons. The more you play of each, the more you can level them up to unlock even more weapons and abilities. The campaign has a variety of mission types, including killing all the enemies, capturing the flag, holding a specific point, or fighting souped up mega enemies. Once you've completed all that, there are still still challenges and quick play modes to keep you entertained, unlocking new content for many, many hours. The sequel introduced five new classes. Killstreak abilities make a return alongside leveling up and other progression. Sky9 did a fantastic job advancing the series by adding new classes, content, and a few tweaks and mechanical updates. There's just enough new things going on here to give returning fans plenty more to enjoy and soak in without feeling repetitive or like the same old, same old. That's always a tough balance to strike, and they did it very well here. The main complaint people had against this game is that your AI teammates can be quite useless. But it doesn't really harm the fun to have to carry the team when you kinda wanna be front and center blasting things to bits anyways. It's still heaps of fun. Strike Force Heroes 3 had a slightly more controversial reception upon release. It broke further away from what the first two games had established, now favoring randomized heroes modified through perks and weapons, rather than the character building seen before. Campaign levels now have multiple win conditions available, which can be a pro or con depending on personal preference. That initial reception might not have been as strong, but many have warmed up to it. 
it. Learning that there is equally as much fun and exciting new content to discover, just less of it is readily available from the get-go. I won't go super in-depth with it, but the fan base is still pretty torn on this one, and despite its overall very positive reception, fans do still consider it the weakest in the series. There was one more stopping point after the Flash series, but before the eventual full release. This was Strike Force Heroes Extraction, a mobile game that blended the action shooting aspects we already knew with something akin to an endless runner. It has the unique cover mechanic that sets it apart from similar runner mobile games, helping keep one foot in that more familiar territory of the original series. There are 20 playable characters to be unlocked, a campaign, survival, and free run mode, with plenty of high action shooting goodness. Unfortunately, before I hype this one up any further, it is no longer available. According to Sky9, the game had to be pulled from stores. Adobe Flex Builder, what they used to make Extraction, was discontinued, leaving them without the ability to update it for future iOS versions. For the same reason, it never even made it to Android. It's such a shame, I would absolutely have loved to have tried this one out. Maybe they'll find a way to incorporate that gameplay as a separate mode in the upcoming release. So allow me to segue into something very exciting. There is currently a live Kickstarter campaign for the complete remake of the Strike Force Heroes trilogy. At the time of this video's upload, it'll be running for about one more week until early September, so you have time. It's already past its base goal, so you can contribute to this game knowing absolutely that it will be completed, and you can help it continue forward to the many stretch goals it has laying ahead. From their own Kickstarter page, Strike Force Heroes has been completely reimagined from the ground up featuring a fully voiced expanded campaign, animated cutscenes, new loot system, tons of new replayability options, all in glorious four-player split-screen co-op or PvP. While I'm sure not everyone will love every change they're making, they seem to be committed to listening to the fans, making sure this remake is the best it can be, while still honoring what everyone knows and loves about the originals. The new art style, to me, it looks to be of a much higher, much more consistent quality, with these incredible effects bringing all that chaos to life. But I have to admit, it may have lost a tiny bit of the charm that existed with the more simplistic style. But it all feels worth the trade-off for how vibrant the new footage looks and feels. It's so exciting and punchy. I am unbelievably excited for this one and wanted to do my part to make sure fans of the original don't miss out on their chance to back this game, hit some stretch goals, and make it as big and grand as it deserves to be. Next up, we have another point-and-click meets escape room series, this time from developer Script Welder. However, the Don't Escape games are distinctly unique in how they blend those genres and especially how it approaches the concept of an escape room. In fact, that distinction is communicated directly within the title. The goal of these escape room games is to do just the opposite. Don't escape. How exactly that's presented across the trilogy is wildly different each time. First off, you're on the outskirts of a medieval village. You must fortify this shack with anything you find laying around, securing the doors, windows, and yourself to all last through the night. Because when night falls and the moon rises, you become a ravenous werewolf, hell-bent on killing. The better you managed to restrain yourself, stopping you from escaping, the less deaths there will be. It's a short game in encouraging you to play a couple times to find the various endings and attempt to get a 100% success. Don't Escape 2 is a similar premise, but added to in really clever ways. You are now riding out a zombie apocalypse, boarding up a shelter to survive the horde. The mechanics are generally the same, however, time is now a consideration that must be made. 
Whenever you venture out, you are eating up time as a resource. You have to be thorough and plan ahead because backtracking is costly. You have to find resources, seek the help of others, who can then lessen the time it takes to do different tasks, make tough decisions, and be sure you're back in time to make your last stand. S sorry, no, not the last stand, just, just a last stand. For Don't Escape 3, you are lost in space. You awake to find your crew killed, and that you are stuck not only needing to survive, but also unravel a sci-fi mystery. This third game has a stronger focus on story compared to the first two, and I like the way it embraces what became the crux of the series. Working through the game is one thing, but it's much more about the trial and error of exploring and attempting to perfect this anti-escape. Adding in numerous endings is a great way to encourage people to replay things and look for the hidden details. It's a joy to attempt over and over, rather than being stuck without a means to progress, encouraging you to try alternate solutions. Mixed in among the release of those three games was Script Welder's more straightforward point-and-click adventure series, Deep Sleep. Those games are a wild ride all on their own, I recommend them as well. And they are technically also getting a sequel, although we don't have a ton of details for them yet. Instead, I need to draw your attention to the available full release, Don't Escape, Four Days to Survive. I'm a huge fan of the way they made four both a indicator of this being a follow-up while hiding it in the subtitle of the game. It's just very clever. I cannot fully express how incredible this game is. It is sitting at the unheard of 99% positive on Steam. Across those four days, you are presented with new scenarios to prepare for and attempt to survive. There's much more flexibility than even in the first three games, in that you can live through a day far below 100% success. This game does something I've never seen in any other point-and-click title. It has actual replayability. Usually, once you know all the solutions, you can just fly through one of these games on a second go-around. Here, you'll want to play each day again to try and do better. But in addition to that, each day also has two variations. The exact same items and resources and objects are available in the area each time. It's a matter of picking, choosing, and utilizing that equipment in a multitude of ways to succeed, and applying it to the specific problem you're facing. And as if that wasn't already brilliant, the story is far deeper than in the previous titles, laced in in a way that'll leave you needing to play through things at least two times. So having what amounts to to eight different days to play through repeatedly leads to a lot of content. This story goes so far as to reward Script Welder's die-hard fans by also tying in every previous Deep Sleep game as well. Playing through those six games, ending in this seventh, seeing it all come together is a wonderful experience. Those two trilogies are available to purchase for cheap on Steam. I highly recommend buying them to support Script Welder, especially as he continues his work on Deep Sleep 4. And after you're all caught up, you can watch my video explaining precisely how complex these games are, how they all weave together into a top-tier, layered, dark, deep, and twisted narrative. This series is a 10 out of 10, I can't wait to see where it all goes next. Definitely play those games, and if you're a fan, you're going to love that video. Next, we're reaching notably further back than the others so far, all the way back to 2005. Motherload was a bona fide classic, carrying on an all-time hot streak of memorable games from X-Gen Studios. In many ways, they set the high bar for Flash games back in these early days. Stick RPG, Fishy, Defend Your Castle, these games all ruled, and in many ways still hold up with their simplistic and well-executed premises. Motherload actually had the least plays of any of those titles over on Newgrounds, but I played and replayed this game as many times as the rest of them. 
In a post-Minecraft era, it's difficult to remember that there was a time where digging into the earth and collecting squares of minerals wasn't the premise of half of all new indie games. Instead, Motherlode took inspiration from arcade classics like Dig Dug and Boulder Dash. You play as this little mining pod, with the mission of extracting resources from below the surface to then sell. It's a very simple gameplay loop of collecting more and selling more. You have a limited amount of fuel, a limited storage capacity, and can easily blow up by bumping into walls. You must gently navigate your own tunnels to not crash and burn, collecting what you can, and leaving enough fuel for the return trip. You can then spend that money on upgrades that will allow you to make a deeper journey each time, taking higher risks for greater rewards. It's simple, but was a wonderful time killer for many years, and if you wanted to go all out, could easily be played for hours. While that original title dates back a full 17 years, it's already been long enough that the follow-up Super Motherlode is nearly a decade old itself. It wrinkles the brain to think that that's the timeline we're working with now for these Flash classics. That's part of why I really love making videos like this. It'll be nostalgic for many reminding them of their old favorites, but hopefully can also introduce these classics to an entirely new generation who are possibly younger than the games themselves. I find the revised art style to be incredible. I truly love it. The original looks quite flat and bland in comparison to this retro-esque sci-fi fusion 80s mix-up. The sequel has much more of a story with a full voice cast, and most importantly, the addition of four-player co-op multiplayer. If a brand new addictive adventure you can play with your friends wasn't enough to convince you already, this game comes with a polished and preserved version of the original, Motherlode Goldium Edition. So really, you're getting two games for the price of one, are contributing to that preservation, and hopefully helping X-Gen work towards their next release. I would love to see something new from them. However, I need to warn, this is only sitting at a 77% positive on Steam. So three quarters of people like it, but that's not a great ratio. It leans closer to its arcade inspirations and becomes more puzzle-oriented. Many found that the story interrupts what made the original game fun. In order to keep the player progressing through the campaign, many things had to be changed. Running out of fuel now only slows you down rather than ending an attempt, so there's not much of a sense of danger. Others found the game to feel weightless, and upgrades can only be purchased when the game decides. So the gameplay loop is quite different. The good thing is that buying this game allows you to play the polished original version that people know and love, but it might not be worth the price tag outside of a sale for many, considering those differences. And there is actually a Super Motherlode board game as well that appears to be generally more well received. Their gameplay is very different, with the physical game being a tile-laying deck-building game. So who knows, maybe you get a group of four friends together and play both versions for the ultimate Motherlode nostalgia night. It's pretty cool to see the series expand in that way. And last on the list, certainly not least, Epic Battle Fantasy. These indie epics are a series of turn-based RPG adventures drawn and programmed by one individual. This is Matt Rojak, who also goes by Matt Likes Swords or Koopo Games. While Matt has plenty of spin-offs and tangentially related games, primarily the Bullet Heaven series, the core epic battle fantasy has five games, dating back to 2009. It has a charming anime style, is packed with interesting characters and creatures, rewards exploration, has juvenile dialogue, loads of references, and an overall freewheeling, fun-loving style. There are no random battles or tropes of depressed protagonists acting out some metaphor for their trauma. The epic battle fantasy series revels in what makes this genre so captivating and what makes the gameplay fun on a strategic level, all without wasting the player's time or ever taking itself too seriously. 
This is a funny one to include on this list because its path forward has been much more winding than anything else shared here. Years before Flash was even announced to be shutting down, Matt has remained committed to making his games available through various paid and free platforms, far before anybody else from the Flash world really bothered to do so. That unique path of expanding the series, making it more widely available, while still supporting your loyal browser-based community is very impressive technically, and very admirable just personally. Just look at this odd timeline of releases. In 2009, we had Epic Battle Fantasy 1 and 2. In 2010, he released the third game in both browsers and Steam, both for free, to test launching games on Steam and to generate some hype for the future of the series. Three years later, in 2013, we had Epic Battle Fantasy IV in browsers, followed up a year later by its own Steam release. This is the first time he ever sold any of these games, which luckily was also successful and allowed him to fund the massive undertaking of Epic Battle Fantasy V, which launched on Steam in 2018. For the first time, one of these skipped the browser. However, he did promise that if the game sold well, he would remain committed to updating it further. So after a successful launch in 2020, he did a full version 2.0 update, greatly expanding the game and then adding a free browser based alternative. He is actively denying himself sales by doing that, but is also keeping the game and franchise accessible to anyone who feels they can't currently afford it. In 2021, he released the original Epic Battle Fantasy on mobile devices. And now, in 2022, Epic Battle Fantasy V has been released on mobile entirely for free, and we very recently saw the release of the Epic Battle Fantasy Collection on Steam. That one is paid, although it is cheap, and includes the first two Epic Battle games, as well as several spin-offs and other titles from Koopo Games. As you can see, there's no single moment where he moved on from browser to full release. In all that time, spanning 13 years, creating new games and porting old ones, Matt frequently has returned to his older titles to optimize and support them any way he can. He takes every known opportunity to thank his fans, never allowing even the first game to fade away into obscurity. I couldn't possibly summarize the story or all the ways these games have differed and improved over the years. Instead, I'll save that for a hypothetical monster future video, and instead hope that I can help you see exactly where and how you can play each game. Flash game preservation is generally important to me, so I want to make sure people are aware of the free ways they can continue to enjoy these games, and if you've got the money to spend and want to support these longtime developers, then absolutely purchase one of the follow-ups to their classic series. As with any of the Flash originals on this list, Blue Maxima's Flashpoint is the best way to boot them up and play them for free exactly as you remember it. Ruffle emulation is something being developed that replaces Flash Player and allows these games to continue to be played in browser on the original sites they were found, like Newgrounds. For now, you can play games made in either Action Script 1 or 2, such as Epic Battle Fantasy 1 and 2, directly in browser. You just follow the links, don't have to do anything else. For things made in Action Script 3, Ruffle hasn't quite got there yet, so the only extra step you need is to install the new grounds player. Then it's simple to click and open, and you can begin playing right away. Wrapping all this up, in the description down below, I will have links to all of these Steam pages. Allow allowing you to buy any of the games that are already released and wishlisting any others that are upcoming or for any that you'd rather wait for a sale. I will especially remind you to wishlist Alice is Dead as that does directly benefit me and I'd love to see that series find a whole new audience. And I will direct you to the Strike Force Heroes Kickstarter as that is still running for one more week and I'd love to see how far above that base goal we can take it. Please continue to share your suggestions of both Flash series that you would love to see covered in full Flashlight videos, or simply those that you want people to be made aware of in 
these flash forward videos so we can more directly monetarily support these developers the way they deserve. Doing a full flashlight video on the Epic Battle Fantasy series has been the most requested video of mine directly behind doing Madness Combat. But seeing as that video has finally released, part one at least, I'm still working on part two, I can now say Matt Rojic's series takes the top spot by a mile. Trust me, I would love to make that video and still plan to someday. However, I would need to play literally hundreds of hours worth of games. I feel I need to chug water of life just in anticipation of planning, scripting, recording, and editing that monster video. Never say never, I would love to do it, but I am saying don't expect it anytime soon. Thank you all so much for watching, thank you to patrons of the channel for their continued support, and I'll see you all again soon.